Welcome, and in this lecture, you're going to be going over Chapter 25, Section 1, and we're going to be looking at the Americas and Oceania in this chapter. So the first section is going to cover the settling of and the conquering of the Americas. So to prepare for the lecture, I want you to create a spice chart with two columns, and you're going to keep one column of notes for Latin America and one column for North America because you're going to be working on an essay this week that's going to be comparing the process of colonization in both of the regions. So when you're ready with your spice chart, you don't need to write all these explanations. That's there for you to help to help explain to you what a spice chart is in case you forgot. And go ahead and go to the next slide when you're ready. Okay, so we'll move on. And in section one, you're going to look at the colliding worlds that come together in the um, the aftermath of Christopher Columbus's voyages. So before I get started with the section, I want to explain this concept of the role geography plays in all of this process that we're going to look at. So here we have the two hemispheres that had been separated. There was no interaction. There were very, very few limited sporadic contacts over the course of history that didn't produce any meaningful interaction until 1492, when the voyages of Columbus lead to the Spanish colonization and then the subsequent colonization of other European countries. So if you look at this map, in Afro-Eurasia, you have most of the world's large domesticatable animals. And so these animals provided different diets, but they also fueled population growth and living near animals also led to the acquiring of diseases. So people of Afro-Eurasia had about 10, well, about, at this time, it was probably about eight or 9,000 years of a head start building immunity to different types of diseases like the chicken pox, measles, smallpox, as opposed to the people of the Americas who had not encountered these germs. So people who were alive in 1492 had already, you know, been the people whose gene pool survived different epidemics throughout history. So they had a much different immune system. In addition, the agricultural lands that are good for, for farming initially and where agriculture starts occur on a horizontal axis. So anywhere within this circle, with the exception of like the very mountainous Himalayas, for example, but, but anywhere within this, this marking I have here, you can grow, you can take a crop that grows in one place like China and grow it in the Mediterranean like they did with rice. So there's going to be much, much more diffusion of crops. And on top of that, the animals, we have a much faster population growth, which means we're going to see more empires. More empires means they're going to expand into each other's spaces a lot sooner. There's going to be a lot more warfare. And there's going to be then a lot more advances in military technology. When you compare that to the Americas, the land where you have agricultural-based empires was very, very small. And it was just this little region in Mesoamerica. And then you had some in the Andes as well. But crops don't diffuse very well from north to south. So the potato had a hard time diffusing initially into North America because crops diffuse very slowly. It's not like you you go and you travel and you get there quickly. A crop spreads because the neighboring people plant it and continue to plant it in neighboring lands until it reaches its new destination, right? But if you're going north and south, the climate changes a lot more than it changes east to west. And so crops are going to kind of reach the zones where they're going to get stuck until the more modern era with modern transportation where we can now move it faster like we did with ships with the potato. So that's the reason why the population of the Americas is much more susceptible to European conquest. So you have to understand that, that it has nothing to do with the superiority of one culture over another. It has to do with the, the role geography played in shaping different people. And so there are going to be many factors that were involved in the conquest. And that's one of the things I want you to be able to answer in class is 
when we look at the conquest and when you listen to these lectures, be able to explain to me the different factors that allowed the Europeans to conquer the indigenous people in the Americas. And it isn't just um, weapons. Disease is going to play a role. Military strategies are going to play a role. Europeans had with the mastiffs, these big dogs, and they had horses. And then even using like the Aztecs technology of these causeways that connected the island of Tenochtitlan to the surrounding areas made them susceptible. The Europeans cut them off from any food. So I'll explain that a little bit later. So just kind of look out for that. So we start by looking at the Spanish Caribbean. This was the first place that the Spaniards landed after Columbus's voyages, right? He lands in the island that becomes known as Hispaniola. And pretty soon, the Spaniards prefer the larger islands, which become, you know, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. And initially, they want to set up trading posts, right? Remember, they first think that they've arrived in Asia. And it takes a few years for them to realize, okay, they're, they're not in Asia. And this is, in fact, lands that the Europeans had never been familiar with. So they're trying to establish trade posts and trade with the people there. The Tainos welcome them. They're very welcoming. They share what they have with them. Um, the Spaniards see that they have gold. They're wearing gold rings or gold earrings. And they begin to want to get more gold. So they don't want to do the work, of course. So they institute a system called the encomienda. And an encomienda is a land grant. It means the king gave the Spaniards that were there, these settlers, they gave them the right to claim a certain amount of land and to make the natives there work for them as long as they converted them to Christianity and looked out for them. So these landowners that came from Spain became known as encomenderos. So in these encomiendas, they essentially exploited the natives to work for them. And the Tainos rebelled, but their rebellion was done with bows and arrows, which didn't compare to the weapons that the Europeans brought with them. And a big disruption came in 1518 when smallpox reaches the Caribbean islands. And so the smallpox then begins to spread among the Taino populations who don't have an immunity to this disease and they end up, a lot of them end up dying off. So by the 1540s, most, you know, we go from a population of about 4 million people in, in the Caribbean to only a few thousand by 1540. So less than 50 years after Columbus, the islands of the Caribbean are severely depopulated. And so part of that was the brutality as well, right? You could see the picture there of people having their hands, their arms chopped off. This was one of the punishments that was used. When the, when the Spaniards demanded that, they, that the natives bring them gold, they would give them quotas of how much gold to bring. And when people would not show up with the amount of gold, the Spaniards would severely punish them. Sometimes they would cut off their noses. Sometimes on some occasions they had to cut off their ears and then wear them around their neck. So this also contributed to the, the demise of the Tainos, and this is kind of where the, a lot of the controversy that you might have heard about with Columbus Day uh, comes from, because this is the type of practice that's initiated by Columbus's quest for gold. And then the creation of that encomienda system enslaved the native populations, forces them to mine for the Europeans with no regard to their population. So when disease begins to kill off most of the people, the Spaniards kind of lose some interest in the Caribbean islands and they go further inland. But then later on, you know, other settlers begin to go to the Caribbean, the French, the English, the Dutch, with the intention of setting up plantations. So the Caribbean shifts from a population from mining to agriculture. And they find that these lands are very suitable for sugar and sugar is very profitable in Europe. This land is much larger than the islands in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic that the Spaniards were cultivating sugar with. But since there was no, not a lot of indigenous people left, they began to import slaves. And so this also sets off the slave trade uh, across the Atlantic. And we're going to study that 
in the next chapter. So if you look at the population of the Caribbean today, if you look at countries like the Dominican Republic, uh, like Cuba, like Jamaica, the people there are descendants of Africans. They don't look like the people of like mainland um, Peru or Ecuador or Mexico. Okay, they're, they're not so much indigenous. They're a lot more African or, and mixed African-European because of this process that's taking place. So once by 1510, they're making expeditions to see what else is out there. Hernán Cortés set sail from Cuba. He was a Spanish conquistador, but he was by now, by 1517, the capital is in Cuba, in Santiago, Cuba. He set sail to explore the mainland of Mexico, and he has permission to go there to seek wealth, right? He doesn't have permission to establish colonies. He doesn't have permission to settle. So Hernán Cortés leaves Cuba without permission. Um, because his intent was to go conquer. When the governor of Cuba found out that Cortes was planning to set up his own colony, he sends men to arrest Cortes, but Cortes is gone. And that action of him doing this illegally is actually going to be a blessing in disguise for him. So in 1519, he, led, he leads an expedition of 450 soldiers into Mexico, and they make their way from Isla Mujeres, Cozumel, uh, maybe he stopped in Cancun for spring break. We don't know. He goes around to the Bay of Campeche, to Tabasco, and then he sets up a colony in Veracruz. He calls it La Via Rica de la Veracruz. And as he's doing this, he's, he's just having some extraordinary luck. One of those was when he reaches the mainland in the Yucatan Peninsula, he gets into a skirmish with the native people there and defeats them. So they bring him gifts. And one thing they bring him was a soldier, or not a soldier, but a, 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 an explorer who had been shipwrecked in a previous expedition. His name was Jerónimo de Aguilar. And Jerónimo de Aguilar had been living amongst the Mayan people for seven years, so he had learned the Mayan language. But they also give him a former, you know, Aztec from, well, not Aztec, but Nahuatl speaking princess that had been sold into the Yucatan by her mother who had married another man and kind of wanted to get the daughter out of the picture. So this young woman, she's about 15 years old, she's sold to Mayan merchants and she makes her way down to the Yucatan Peninsula. And so she's gifted to Cortes. And she happens to speak Mayan and Nahuatl. So now Cortes has translators. He's able to speak Spanish to Jerónimo de Aguilar, and Aguilar is able to speak to Semalinali and or Malintzin. So and Malintzin knows Mayan and Nahuatl. So when he reaches Veracruz and he begins to reach the more Nahuatl speaking part of Mexico, Aguilar and Malintzin are his translators. And so he's able to communicate intentions, and as a result, he's able to build alliances. And something your book kind of doesn't doesn't mention uh, very well. You're, and and th this is why some myths about history are propagated. Because one of the myths of this conquest is that the Spaniards conquered the Aztec Empire with a handful of Spaniards, right? With just a handful of men. But it wasn't just a handful of men. Cortes learns that some people don't like paying tribute to the Mexica. So he builds an alliance, especially with the people of Tlaxcala. So in addition to his few hundred men and his horses and his mastiffs, he also has almost 100,000 Tlaxcalan warriors and other native warriors. In other places, when he would defeat people in battle, then he would form an alliance with them. And they were winning battles because they, were, they had steel swords as opposed to um, obsidian blade um, weapons. So the steel sword cuts much faster, so it allows you to kill more people instantly. In addition, when the Mexica are fighting, they're trying to capture them. Because in their, in their um, warfare, the goal is to capture your enemy and then ceremoniously kill him later. So when they had the chance to kill Cortes or other soldiers, they wouldn't because they're not trying to kill them, they're trying to capture them. 
And in that hesitation, someone else comes up from behind and kills them. So the difference in, in warfare tactics also plays a role. And then the Spaniards, when Cortes suffers a defeat, he retreats, he leaves Mexico City, he leaves Tenochtitlan, and he regroups and he builds more alliances. By then, the governor of Cuba has sent an expedition to arrest Cortes. And when that expedition gets there, Cortes shows him all the gold and all the gifts that he's encountered along the way. And he tells this guy who goes to arrest him, he says, hey, I know what we did was wrong, but look at all this wealth. The king is going to want this and he's going to forgive us for this. So he has a little, he fights him, he kind of duels him and he wins. So then this guy joins Cortes' expedition. So it refueled Cortes' uh, troops and, and brought a whole bunch of fresh new horses. Cortes disbands his ships. He orders the people to carry them overland from the Gulf of Mexico into Lake Texcoco and rebuild them as small ships on Lake Texcoco. And then they cut off the causeways, these bridges that link the Nochtitlan to the outside world. He cuts them off so they can't have food from the outside. They have to rely on what they're growing on their chinampas. And he cuts off the fresh water that came from Chapultepec. And that's where they provided fresh water. The water on the lake is too murky to drink. So Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, depended on water from Chapultepec. Cortes cuts that water off. And so this feels, you know, malnutrition. And then disease by then is also beginning to spread. The smallpox brought over by Europeans is now beginning to spread. So Cortes waits a few months for the people of Tenochtitlan to start dying of disease and starvation. And then that's when they launch their attack and they conquer the Mexica. They capture the emperor Cuauhtémoc, who was the last emperor. They torture him, trying to get gold out of him. And that takes place in 1521. So Cortés starts, he, he does his first expeditions in 1517. And by then he knows there's more land and more gold. And he hears of this city. He keeps hearing of the city of gold, which is Tenochtitlan, right? It was a magnificent city. And so when... He arrives in 1519. It takes from 1519 to 1521 to conquer the Mexica. And that's just the conquest of one group. They will remain conquering town and, and, and different tribes over the next few centuries. But this is the beginning of Spanish colonization in Mexico. And then a few uh, years later, in the 1530s, Francisco Pizarro, represents, you know, does the same thing. So in 1530, he takes 180 soldiers and again, begins to form allies. Does Takes the same steps as Cortes, finds translators, he finds allies, he finds people that don't like living under Inca rule, who don't like paying Inca, Inca tribute. And so they form an alliance with them. And he begins to then attack the Inca. And so by 1533, they've taken... Um, control of Cusco. He calls a conference of all the ruling elites, and then when they get together, he kills them all except for the ruler Atahualpa. And then Atahualpa, you see him here being beheaded. He's kept so that he can give them the gold. Where's the gold? Where's your gold? And then after they get what they want, he is eventually um, decapitated. So those were the conquests that gave the Spaniards power over a lot of the lands in Latin America. We call it Latin America because the language they imposed is um, based off of Spanish, which is a Latin-based lang Latin language. So in your book, it calls it the Iberian Empires, and that's because these empires, the countries ruling them, came from the Iberian Peninsula. So Latin America falls under the control of Spain and for Brazil under control of the Portuguese. So the Spaniards set up capital cities in Tenochtitlan, which they now call Mexico, right? This is Mexico City. In Peru, they make Lima, Peru their capital. They set up Buenos Aires. In La Florida, which is Florida, St. Augustine, in okay, San Agustin, becomes an important city. And then later on, as the population grows, they begin to urbanize, they begin to create new cities to help them administer cities like Concepcion and Panama and Acapulco and Zacatecas and so forth. So you can see the map there, the lands in purple were Spanish possessions and those in orange, Brazil, 
was Portuguese. And then in North America, we see French possessions of French claiming land for King Louis, which is why it's called Louisiana, all the way up to Canada. And then the English on the eastern seaboard, where you see Jamestown, New York, Boston, right? So those are those are colonies that were named after European monarchs, right? And I think I've explained that before. Virginia, the Carolinas after King Charles, Virginia after Queen Elizabeth. And then the Portuguese, the way they ended up with Brazil has to do with these imagine this imaginary line that they drew um, with the Spaniards, right? And this is kind of like the, the Eurocentrism between Portugal and Spain saying, hey, you know, us too, we're going to decide what the whole world's going to be like. So they draw this line on a map and they said anything east of that line is Portugal. And the, the, the map there has it wrong. Okay, the map says Spain and Portugal, and it's the other way around. Okay, so I don't know why, why it has that. Or maybe it means Spain is off limits and Portugal is off limits. I don't know. But where it says Spain, it should say Portugal. All that land, right, the Indian Ocean, was for Portugal to explore if it wasn't controlled by Christians. Anything west of that line, Spain could claim. So that's why Spain claims Mexico and uh, the Inca Empire. But there was a sailor, Pedro Alvarez de Cabral, who on his way to into the Indian Ocean is tacking, which he's taking that Volta do Mar, and he sees land on their side of the line, right? Because, you know, they didn't know that was there yet. And so that becomes Brazil. And at first there's not a lot of interest, but again, as more people begin to see that there's rich fields for the cultivation of sugar, the Portuguese lay claim to that. And Brazil becomes the main destination for slaves during the transatlantic slave trade. So with the cultivation of sugar, the Caribbean and Brazil become the destinations where the transatlantic slave trade was, was occurring. So 85% of all the slave trade went to those regions. Now, looking at how these societies were administered, okay, what colonial society looks like. These the, the Spaniards they try to set up a government in the image of Spain. So they built the cities to look like European cities with their plaza in the middle, the municipal palace on one side, the cathedral on the other, right? And you see these throughout, you know, Mexico City looks like this, Guanajuato, San Miguel de Allende pictured up here, Zacatecas. You go to any old city in Mexico, and this is the layout. And so they're trying to create a replica of Europe, but they're only doing it in the cities. The, the European settlers, they like to live in the cities. They don't like to live out in the country. The countrysides remain largely indigenous and mostly impoverished. So the Spanish government doesn't really get involved here. They send a viceroy, but the Spanish kings don't really care to govern the Americas. They send viceroys to do their governing and... They create audiencias, these audiences to kind of keep them in check. But this is the root of the corruption. When we talk about like political corruption in Latin America, a lot of people like look at Mexico or look at Guatemala or Brazil as very corrupt um, societies. That corruption goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Because of this nature, when the people of the colonies needed something from the king of Spain, it would sometimes take years two years for the king of Spain to respond. So if you wanted something done here and you didn't want to wait for the king of Spain to give the approval, then you kind of went off on your own. Or like you read in the book, when the king did say, do this, if the viceroy didn't like it, he would say, cumplo, pero, uh, obedezco, pero no cumplo. I obey, but I do not comply. And so the way to get things done was by knowing the right people and paying the right people to do you the favor. And so that becomes a system that gets ingrained in the politics. So they're trying to create this ideal society. They're trying to create a government that protects the natives. They're trying to create a government that is based on Christian values. And they're trying to create a government that keeps the check on them. But none of that occurs, right? The encomienda system leads to a lot of abuses of the native population. In some places, the natives are allowed to kind of create their own governments called Republicas de Indios, so long as they're paying a tribute to their Christian overlords. 
So that's kind of what the Spanish colonial society was like. So they tried to create a government that was based on kind of a European model. But what ended up happening was more of an authoritarian, more of a, you know, the viceroy had a lot of authority. And then even then, outside of these main cities, the local audiencias, they're the ones that were important. So it goes, it goes back to that corruption thing. If you want something done, you have to pay the alcalde, the mayor, and then the mayor will take it up with the viceroy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that gets ingrained early on in Spanish colonial society. Now, things look different in North America. So now we're looking at this other column, right? North America did not have large centers of population to conquer. The native people in North lived semi-nomadic lifestyles. There were some settler colonies or set some settlements, um, but the population was nowhere near as large as like Mexico City, right, which had over a million people by the time the Spaniards arrived. So it was possible in North America to establish a colony alongside a native settlement and interact with them and trade with them and not have to conquer them. So what you see is you begin to see these settler colonies, um, different Europeans claiming different lands. And they're, they're little forts. So, you know, trading posts. So Quebec starts as a trading post. Um, Roanoke starts as a trading post. You have the French setting up Quebec. You have the British setting up places like Jamestown. And then you have the Dutch setting up New Amsterdam, which then is seized by the British, and it becomes New York, and that's the one pictured on the bottom corner. And in the background, you can see the wall that I talked about last time, which is where we get Wall Street from today. Um, so Europeans found colonies in the North in a very different process. They're using joint stock companies and charters. Okay, so they're being created by business people for trade. So they're charters, right? Here you see King William and Mary to the inhabitants of Providence of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Right, so you have New England here in the pink. New France is in the blue. New Spain is in the orange. And they're there to trade, to get fur, um, to get beaver pelts, to get whatever they can. And they're depending on provisions sent from Europe. And when those provisions don't come in, then you end up having a lot of hardships. So that's how the colonization starts in the north. Okay, um, The colonial governments, they, they differed in a lot of ways from the governments of Brazil and of Spain in the, in the Americas, in the Iberian empires, right? Over there, they had royal backing. Um, they had the king kind of sending people. The colonies in North America, which is what we're going to refer, refer to geographically for this class as the U.S. and Canada, even though Mexico and the Caribbean are part of the continent of North America, when we say it in this class, we're referring to the U.S. and Canada. Um, they were being backed by business people. So the colonists had private investors investing in it, which is different from having the government and the kings being the ones investing in it. So there was no viceroy, there were no audiencias. There were settlers, right, who kind of ran affairs on their own, you know, as part of these different chartered colonies. And then, in, you know, after the 17, Seven Years' War in 1763, the French colonies in Canada fall under British control. And then over time, then they begin to institute a little bit more government. And lastly, the um, thing you want to also be able to compare are the relationships with indigenous people. So based on what I talked about and based on what the, what the book talked about, right, be able to compare the relations with indigenous people, right? Because they treat them differently. There are different conflicts. But we have in Latin America, you have the native people being engaged in the society there being the people who survived because you had over a million people even though you lose a lot of people to disease you still have a significant number of native people in the valley of mexico that you can use as labor and the spanish settlers came over as explorers conquistadores trying to get rich they came over just men 
So they mix with the native women and they create a mestizo population. In the North American colonies, the colonists came and they established settlements and they brought their entire families with them. So they're not marrying or having relations as much. They, they do occur, but not as much in the northern colonies. So you don't see as much ethnic mixing. It does happen, of course, um, but they're coming as families and they're, they're trading with them. And then, you know, when there's conflict, they're, they're, you know, they usually do conquer them. But the initial intent was not to conquer and take, you know, the entire land and claim it for themselves. It was to trade with them. But over time, as their population grew and as their needs grew, then they began to not like that. Hey, well, you know, we want access to this river or we want this. And it would conflict with the native ways of living. And that's when the Europeans started to see a lot more conflict and attacks on indigenous communities. Um, in fact, one of the first, the first, I think, official Thanksgiving, not the hol not like Thanksgiving, the holiday, not the story of the pilgrims, but a documented case of the governor of the Massachusetts Bay declaring thanks a day of Thanksgiving came to give thanks for their successful raid of the Pequot um, people. And that was like in 1637. So again, going back to the controversy with Columbus Day, right? This is what, when you know, Thanksgiving coming up, this is where, you know, you, you have an event that happened once of a peaceful meal. But when you look at the rest of the conquest and the rest of the colonization of the Americas, it wasn't as peaceful as that dinner with the pilgrims, right? There were going to be, there are going to be more, more battles, attacks on communities, burning down villages. Um, and then the natives are also going to attack back because they feel like the European settlers aren't respecting the resources that they've been used to living on. So by 1800, indigenous people in what is today the United States only had, you know, they had numbered about, you know, 600,000 um, and about 5 million European settlers. So the population is displaced by disease and by war in both regions. But in Latin America, there was a whole lot more ethnic mixing that went on because of the uh, sugar plantations and because of the encomienda system. So, all right. Sorry, I ran a little bit long, um, but I kind of wanted to give you some some deeper explaining. This is this is a topic that I you know when I was in college I did study this a lot more. So I, I kind of have some stuff that the book also kind of glosses over. So I hope you found that interesting, and um, I will see you at the next lecture.